today. Uh, we'll kick off our seminar series this fall with our department chair, um, Professor Florian Holzbacher. And I have to take off my glasses to read this fine print <laughs> for his. Um, I will have to take them off as well. Bio sketch. You can just, you know, you know. You can yes. Go it. Go well, I didn't think you wanted me to go extemporaneous. Please don't. And just start riffing. Um, so, Professor Solzbacher is the chair of ECE. He's um, holds the rank of professor. He's also appointed in the Joe Science um, and Engineering and Biomedical Engineering here at, in Utah. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineers and a fellow of the Institute of Biology and um, He is, I think notably as we'll see today, co-founder, um, president and executive director of Black Rock Microsystems and Black Rock Neurotech. His research focuses on harsh environment and microsystems materials, implantable wireless microsystems for biomedical and healthcare applications, and high temperature harsh environment microsensors. Um, and he has a lot of publications and a lot of other things he does outside of the university. So, with that, <laughs> I'll hand it over. Thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, there are a few of you who saw me. Uh, I think a week ago or something like that, where there were a handful of you here in the, in the room we didn't have a seminar. Sorry about that. So it uh, turns out I'm actually taking the first speaker slot. So those of you who've been there have heard some of the things I've commented on. Um, yeah, what I was hoping to do is uh, yeah, give, give an idea as to some of the work that we're doing in the department, hopefully create a little bit of an inspiration. And uh, yeah, I wanted to start off by Welcoming all of you here in in the program. Um, it's exciting to see so many so many faces here. All of you will have this is really dark back. Are you gonna fall asleep on me this way? <laughs> um, really, really dark. Anyways, so the um, yeah, I almost envy you a little bit in the fact that I, I recall when I was sort of entering for first my undergraduate studies and then the Graduate, uh, graduate studies, the uh, projects that you're embarking upon, all the paths that are open in front of you. And I just uh, wish all of you that, you know, sort of your, your dreams are coming true, that you're able to accomplish what you set up to accomplish, that you'll make it through some of the dark valleys we'll all go through, you know, a PhD and a master's is often something where, you know, for the first time, sometimes you hit roadblocks and then you're questioning what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that's why it is so important that you sort of find a um, little bit of a mission for your life or something that you want to do as your next step and find a project that you have real passion for um, because it's important to you, uh, which is what, what gives you sort of a little bit of energy to then recover because unlike, you know, school, um, you're starting to enter the real world and almost all the questions are open-ended and to many of them there is no solution, or not quite the right one, or maybe it's too early. But you're still going to embark on, on doing that. And so, uh, for me, this journey started a long, long time ago, which uh, I sort of made that joke before my wife said I'm very slow and very stubborn. So it uh, started for me 13 years ago, uh, when I was a teenager. I was uh, at an international school where we're doing a lot of uh, social work as well, and so I worked with uh, with disabled children at the time. Um, they had motor deficiencies, and spinal cord injuries, unfortunately, etc. And it frustrated me that we could not give any real hope to restore their function. Then ended up uh, studying electrical and computer engineering with a focus on, uh, on solid state devices, sensors, and electronics on the one hand, and, um, and uh, biomedical engineering on the other hand. Uh, in the hope to be able to, to you know, learn the tools that I would need to make a difference, really. That's what it was all about. And um, actually, as an undergraduate student, got some exposure to some of the first generations of people working in the neural interfaces in Europe. And there was actually a group here in Utah as well, uh, with Ken Horch and uh, Dr. Richard Norman. It's one of my, became eventually one of my senior mentors. Um, we started embarking on thinking about electrodes and how to interface reliably uh, with the nervous system. And uh, then ended up, in my graduate studies, uh, starting my first company, um, 
automotive supplier. Um, that wasn't really in the plans originally, but I learned how to get from an idea to a robust technology to a product that works commercially. Because otherwise, it's not sustainable. Um, you know, it's one thing to solve the te technical or math or physics problem, but in the end, as engineers, and you know, I consider myself an engineer, I'm not a great scientist, but I think I'm doing a decent job in making things work. And it's all about providing something out there to society that makes, makes a difference. And in my case, it was about finding tools that would help us better understand the long-term disorders, find treatment options, understanding the pathological pathways. And so, after, after exiting selling, selling the company to Siemens at that time, um, I uh, reconnected with the University of Utah, where I spent some time during my bachelor's in the mid-90s, and uh, was offered a position as an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Computer Engineering. Um, and then I started focusing on this in earnest and, uh, you know, developing technologies, electrodes, electronics, building teams, working with collaborators within the department, uh, worldwide, across disciplines. And so what I wanted to show you is to some extent, almost starting with a result of what we can do today, which then informs some of the, the subsets of uh, problems and challenges and the opportunities that you may um, that you may encounter. So um, the status is really a sort of a recurring theme that I've encountered through my career is uh, it it won't work, you know, and uh, that included my original declaration a little bit. Naive when I first started that I wanted to work at the university and be in research and teaching and moving things forward, but I also wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I had mentors tell me point blank, you're going to have to make a decision, uh, it won't work. And I sort of responded, which didn't help the relationship at that time with those mentors, watch me. Um, <laughs> And as I said, from today's point of view, I don't necessarily recommend that, but it's definitely possible. And as an engineer, you have the opportunity. You're going to keep learning for the rest of your, your life. Uh, when it comes to building devices that are implanted in the human brain, and that then, you know, for example, interface with record signals, but also have the ability to feed signals back into the brain, uh, the more sensory uh, system. You know, originally when this started, uh, some of the like, you know, from Bonnie and others, they did some of the first work in human subjects with uh, these types of devices, uh, were faced with the criticism of, well, there's no signals there. Somebody's had a spinal cord injury years later, nothing you're going to find at work. Well, it was wrong. It, uh, the signals are still there. The next thing is, well, you can't really do much with it. Well, start showing step by step that there's quite a lot that you can actually do with it. Oh, it won't last. And yes, it's taken quite a while to make things be robust, but we're now at over 30,000 days in human subjects. We've spent over a decade. Um, these things last. Now, it's not easy, and there are hardly ever silver bullets that, uh, that sort of, you know, often there are breakthroughs maybe in materials, new surgical technique, all sorts of things that we're learning. But very often, and you will find it with every one of your projects as well. Often it is a systematic analysis and identifying of things that don't work, why they don't work, coming up with ways to fix them, and then going back to it. And that's why it sometimes takes a bloody long to get to something that works reliably. And, um, and then occasionally you get major, major, major breakthroughs here. So what I wanted to show you up front is a video, and it's one thing that I ask you to not record because I don't have clearance for that to be published. I can use it for educational purposes, but there are a few sections in there that are references to major uh, news outlets, etc., that are sort of patched together. And uh, so those uh, those can be easier just to pause the camera after yeah, this, and then when he's done, but you turn it on. Together. Um, next to this. You may not consider that, but uh, think of privacy. So a lot of our, our uh, subjects, for example, um, you know, about an hour a day or so, they send their uh, caretakers out of the room so that they can write a private email or text. 
message. Think about work environment. Just imagine, you know, you're an engineer in the area, or you're an accountant, or something you work with, or just anything happens on the computer. Every single thing that you do, you would have to do with sort of an eye tracker and, and voice control. It's just not workable. And so, um, what, uh, what uh, Jamie Henderson, Christian Chenoy, and their team came up with, he said, well, since the precision robotics of the signals coming from the electrode and the electronics is now so strong, could we decode handwriting? And they did. So what, you know, somebody with an implant is now doing is, in their head, they have no longer control, in, uh, you, know, um, you know, to anything from, from the neck down, but they can still, just like you and me, do the same, you know, mental brain functions that would normally have moved their arm and are handwriting on a piece of paper. So I mean, essentially they imagine, okay, I'm writing now, on a piece of paper. Of course, their arm isn't moving, but the brain still generates the same signal. Getting to 90 characters per minute right now, 94% accuracy, no post-processing, no fancy filters in the thing, and just decoding that motion. That is about half of what an able-bodied person can do if they're really quite quick on their keyboard. And it's about 10 times faster than anything else that is out there. You know what? They can talk to you about doing that. They can multitask. We take it for, for, for granted. I can walk around, I'm constantly running around, arms are moving, hyperactive, talking to you. For most people that are in that situation, all the other aids that they have, they have to sequentially go through something. Maybe they have a little bit of arm movement, and then maybe they can move a cursor, or they have an eye tracker, and they have to blink it to click on something. And now I want to stop my wheelchair and do something else. And you can. This is intuitive because it taps into the signals that are in our brain. And it allows the sensory feedback, which I'll talk about in a minute. There's plenty, plenty different options. But Ian Burkhardt, he started, and now of course John can't see him right now at Caltech, JJ. Um, we started driving cars. And properly driving cars, not just press a button, but like Full control, steering wheel, accelerator, brakes, um, it's slalom, the figure of eight, the U turns, three point turns, better than the one, than the one that I first did when I started learning how to drive. Um, and so it's really something that uh, gives an awful lot of quality of life back to people. So, how do you get there? I'm going to skip some of their statements now here, we can sort of move forward from that. Um, what do you need for that? You may again encounter that in some encounter that in some of your projects. Um, in the end, the patient, and it's very, very important, no matter what you're doing, you always need to understand what is the application and what is needed to make that work. There was even a case in my first company with the automotive applications. Yes, we were doing you know high temperature sensors. We started with stuff that was put into the McLaren Formula One race car engines and then ended up in transmissions and hydraulic systems and whatever, but at that time these sensors were not being used yet. And so we had to learn and understand what is required in terms of the user, in this case the person inside the car, and then the car manufacturer and the suppliers and what they needed, and then based on that rationale communicate why, for example, this additional sensor would make sense. And we would have to understand Enough about the application, you know, I learned stuff how dual clutch transmissions work, for example, which I never had on here. You know, electrical engineering, don't really have that somewhere in your roadmap of skills to learn. Um, but you have to. And, you know, just like as we went into clinical applications here, I realized very quickly that if we don't understand the workflow of the hospital and the treatment of the patient, you know, from initial intake, the surgery, the caretakers, the fact, you know, another aspect you will see eventually is the reimbursement who pays for all of that. Well, there are actually different insurances and payers for the different stages, from the accident to the initial treatment to the rehab to the long-term care. Um, you need to understand these aspects, and so I would like to encourage you, even though you may have come in to develop a new material for something that is important in batteries, or a new AI technique for, you know, new filters 
fabrication of the speed up, uh, speed up search engines or whatever, um, try to find the area where you dig deep and you contribute your special knowledge for you, a world expert, but make sure that you understand the context. And if you understand what other paths to a solution there may be, you know, sometimes people look at the state of the art and it just looks like an inch to the left and the right. You have everybody who's also used iridium oxide as a material for an electrode. But maybe it's the wrong material in the first place. Or there's very different ways. Or maybe I don't even need an electrode because there are other ways. So then it's very important to understand that. So application of all the aspects. The next thing is, um, now let's assume we've got that figured out. Now we need an electrode. In this case, it's a device that has to interface with biological tissue. Not an easy environment to be in. The body really dislikes it when you put stuff there that doesn't belong. So now we need to figure out, and then it fights back. And that means that the devices you put inside the body tend to fail and be encapsulated. Uh, and sometimes there's collateral damage, i.e. because of the process of fighting back, um, other tissue is, is being damaged. So you need to understand it. So now you need to develop electrodes that invoke as little of a tissue response as possible. That means understanding the biology. Now, you may not have to be the expert in all of that, but you want to talk to somebody who understands neurophysiology, who understands cell cultures, etc., and work with them to figure that out. There's a materials degradation problem. That's a material science challenge. Essentially, what you do is you put devices that are made out of silicon and metal and certain polymers, whatever, into environments that are wet, have ions around them, some amount of current flowing. If they're active, you may have put a battery in there. So to some extent, you're building all sorts of little electrical chemicals, uh, electrochemical cells that want to deteriorate. So you need to figure out how can I prevent that from happening and stabilizing that? So finding encapsulations, finding metallizations and, and, and metallurgy that uh, limits the amount of electrochemical potentials between the different materials, etc., to reduce the deterioration aspects. Now let's say you figured out your chip, the little electrode that you've seen briefly in the video that was held up. Well, that's useless if you can't talk to it, right? So now you need to wire this thing up. You need to get the data out. So now you've got an assembly process, which is partially the electrical materials and the mechanical engineering process, again, uh, has to be figured out. Assume you've got that one, and now it's the electronics. We're going in here, these, uh, these uh, neural signals, action potentials tend to be of the order of no tens to maybe 100 microvolts or so, action potentials, in a millivolt noise environment. And the problem is electric energy, but an amplifier with filters, you crank up the power. Not that easy, because if you now have that as an implantable device, not only do you need low power so that you don't have to drag a car battery around in order to make it work, you also don't want to heat the tissue. There are very, very tight constraints to the amount of electrical power you can dissipate in terms of heat inside the tissue. So, oh, now what you can do is you want to have somebody who can help you with. Um, for example, thermal simulations in environments that have sort of a continuum, but maybe also vascularity, also known as convection. You see how all these things fit together. Um, I'll sort of fast forward a little bit. Let's assume we've got all that sorted out. Now you've got tons of data. Do you care? Actually, what you care about is information, right? So how do we get turned now? You know, you've got 100, in some cases now 1,000. We have a project where we're doing 10,000 and 50,000 channels of electrodes sampling at 10 to 30 kilo samples a second, 12 bits. The amount of data that is generated is mind-boggling. Not easy to deal with. So now you need to figure out how to extract information from that. 95% of it is hash. You know, you just keep recording nothing's happening or something that is not relevant. So now you need to have, and that is very high machine learning, for example, if you're interested in that is coming in, you want to detect features. These action potentials have a specific form. 
if you can find that and replicate that, then maybe you could create an architecture, uh, a little bit like the Internet of Things, or how our own nervous system works is, um, well, on the front end, you have a smart component that keeps constantly, like an endless video tape recording at very high resolution, but it keeps searching also for, well, where is the information? Is there an action potential? How is it timed? Maybe not just spike thresholding, but something that gives you information about how that waveform looks like. And then it only broadcasts instead of n to the power k data points, it just broadcasts, I got information at this time point, and here are the three or four parameters that define within a reasonable error how this waveform looked like. Much less data than all of that that goes downstream. And maybe you then have on the external side, you know, a database or a network that occasionally listens on a channel and keeps listening continuously, and then you can have whatever reinforced learning approaches or others that help you improve those filters. So it's almost like a headquarters that occasionally listens in, sends signals back to your front end and says, you may want to tweak your parameters for your filter a little bit or for uh, your statistical model uh, in order to make it better or respond to something. So, and that is just the beginning. And then you, once you've got that figured out, now what the hell are we going to do with this? Um, so it's, it's a fascinating field that gives a lot of opportunities. And uh, yeah, and some of them are more near term. You know, something that, for example, we figured out and that turned into a large project that we're involved in um, the University of Utah, University of Minnesota, uh, Hanover Medical School in Germany, which is the largest city for cochlear implants, MedL, one of the three big players. Um, uh, my company is also involved, and um, realized that for people with severe hearing deficiencies, there's a technology that you may have heard of, which is called cochlear implants, where you take a little electrode that you insert into the cochlear, which is the same shaped inner ear portion of your ear, and you electrically stimulate there to invoke hearing. Pretty simple. You know, the, 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 the uh, inner ear actually has a tonal copy where the frequencies are sort of following the little spiral of that inner ear, which makes it kind of easy depending on where you're located, you've got a different frequency. One of the challenges is that these electrodes sit in the inner ear in cochlear fluid, with the bony wall behind it, and so actually what happens is that the current spreads out, something again you can simulate through field simulation. Um, and so while you can increase the number of electrodes to get more frequencies, physiologically you don't get it because they all overlap. So somewhere between 8 and 10, you're sort of petering out. So a way to solve that, and at the same time reaching a larger patient population, because sometimes people don't qualify because uh, they have an ossified cochlear or something degenerative to the nerve, whatever. Um, and there's actually a decent percentage of people that doesn't get good hearing out of it. So while well, if we go a little bit further, the auditory nerve connects the cochlear to the brain. The total talking, so that, that sort of spiral uh, frequency distribution continues in the nerve. If you now have an electrode where you can go in and very selectively record and stimulate from individual fascicles, individual nerve fibers, without crosstalk that you have when you go into the cochlear, now you have an opportunity to possibly have a lot more frequencies. And uh, people have done research on that and have shown that somewhere between 50 to 100 frequencies, we get to something that is not so unsimilar to the kind of hearing that you and I are used to. You can probably find there's some online tools that you can find out where you can sort of simulate or somebody where to hear with a cochlear implant with four or six or eight channels. And one-on-one -on -one in a quiet room, that's actually working reasonably well. You can understand. It's a little bit like the electronic equivalent to a blind man's walking stick, but it really, really helps. Once all of you start chit chatting because you get bored, or get bored uh, of what I'm saying here or whatever, he's not going to understand me anymore. If there's music, it sounds horrible in that sense. So that is something that we're trying to do. Now, in order to get into that fairly quickly, however, sometimes the solution is not to develop everything from the ground up. The auditory processor, the actual IPG uh, implantable uh, pulse generator, is actually this module that sits inside the patient, 
for a copy in fun is still very, very valuable. We just need a different electrode and a few other items that we can go into detail later uh, that you need to address. And then you can just like in Lego boxes take those components, a different electrode, assembly, with components that you already have, put them together. And you get much more quickly into a setting where you can then first in animal models and then in the subjects test whether indeed that works better. Um, so, jump into this already a little bit, but I think an important message uh, that I sort of want to bring across is that in almost all applications, uh, there are multiple aspects. And I think it's important for you, even if you specialize in one area, to at least understand the language that people may be speaking in those areas and to have enough knowledge to be a little bit dangerous and be able to define the interfaces. It'll make for a better thesis, a better understanding, it'll make you more competitive as you graduate because you can put things into context and very often when you're, when you're asked to find a solution you may be drawn on board because you're the expert for problem A or B. But there are often different ways of getting there. And just like in optimization problems, often a local minimum or maximum doesn't necessarily lead to a global minimum or maximum or optimum. That's the same thing here. So I want to encourage you to, to look at these aspects. I'll get through this here. Um, applications I've talked about as well. Um, there's obviously when you launch a technology. Uh, an important aspect is to, um, you want this to be driven by something that is, that is relevant and that reaches a lot of people, otherwise it becomes very hard to make it sustainable. That being said, very often when you initially start, it is great to have something that is like a beachhead, a problem case, a patient population that has no other options and where it's uniquely needed. You know, could be like when we started with our high temperature pressure sensors. Initially, it was Formula One race engines and uh, launch vehicles, you know, like Ariana spacecraft and others that didn't care an awful lot about cost, but they cared about performance and reliability. And it was really a, I don't care how much this thing costs, if it costs a million dollars, I'll still want it because it has to do A and B. Same, same with at NASA, you know, my friends at, at NASA, they always say, we're really good at making things work. We're not so good at cost control, you know, because it's really a little bit of, you know, what can we as mankind accomplish? And the reality is that eventually, you need to design to cost in every single application. In this one, it's excruciating. People like, uh, what used to be Iron Flesh, now Texas Instruments, every nine months, a new product. The price pressure, the cycles, is excruciating. It's a fascinating field, but you want to think about is that one area that you want to, to work in. Other areas are much, much slower, and uh, there's a little bit more buffer, but none of them is excluded from it. Then you want to have a path for how you can use some of that and apply it in more and more area, broaden the use cases, broaden the applications, increasing the volume. There's an additional advantage if you work in a niche application initially, it allows you to learn. Because things don't always work from the get-go, you know, and, and it's true even, I mean, usually when a new software comes out, there's always glitches. Now, the software is sort of probably used to the reset button and try again, whatever. You do not want to do that with a pacemaker or a brain implant or an airplane in big flight either. That is why there's regulatory requirements that are very, very intense. And so, as you go out, it's also helpful to start in small and more confined applications and then and then grow that as you gain confidence and if you know how to deal with, with challenges and, and problems. I need to talk a little bit about that. The only reason I have this one in here for brain computer interfaces is that uh, I think something to consider as you're looking at your future career and dreams is to try and find areas that are growing rapidly and that have uh, a lot of sort of firepower behind it. Why? Because it will create more opportunities for you. And it creates an environment that is a lot more failure prone. We all make mistakes, I constantly make I come up with a thousand new ways of making new mistakes almost a year. 
infuriating. When you just clean the infuriate it all out, then you come up with a new way of screening things up. Um, if you're in a domain that is consolidated, markets are going down, it's very competitive, you're out. If you're in a field where you're desperately needed, and uh, lucky for you, electrical engineers overall are really, really desperately needed right now. Everybody's going into computing and other areas, but the reality is 80% of the systems out there are EEs. If I talk to the employers out there, they're begging us to double our production rate of, of uh, engineers at all levels. Because you need people with the kind of background that you're, that you're getting. And that means that you're going out there and, and you're able to learn a little bit and occasionally support. Um, next thing is, you may not consider that, but uh, think of privacy. So a lot of our, our uh, subjects, for example, um, you know, about an hour a day or so, they send their uh, caretakers out of the room so that they can write a private email or text message. Think about your work environment. Just imagine, you know, you're an engineer in there, or you're an accountant, or somebody who works on almost anything happens on the computer. Every single thing that you do, you would have to do with sort of an eye tracker and, and voice control. It's just not workable. And so, um, what, uh, what uh, Jamie Hennessy and Christian Chenoy and their team came up with and said, well, since the precision of the the signals coming from the electro and the electronics is now so strong, could we decode handwriting? And they did. So what you know, somebody with an implant is now doing is, in their head, they have no longer control, in, uh, you know, um, you know, to anything from from the neck down. But they can still, just like you and me, do the same, you know, mental brain functions that would normally have moved their arm and are handwriting on a piece of paper. So I mean, essentially, they imagine, okay, I'm writing now on a piece of paper. Of course, their arm isn't moving, but the brain still generates the same signal. Getting to 90 characters per minute right now, 94% accuracy, no post-processing, no fancy filters at the thing, and just decoding that motion. That is about half of what an able-bodied person can do if they're really quite quick on their keyboard. And it's about 10 times faster than anything else that is out there. You know what? They can talk to you while doing that. They can multitask. We take it for, for, for granted, like a walk around and constantly running around, arms are moving, hyperactive, talking to you. For most people that are in that situation, all the other aids that they have, they have to sequentially go through something. Maybe they have a little bit of arm movement, and then maybe they can move a cursor, or they have an eye track, and they have to blink it to click on something. And now on the stop my wheelchair and do something else, and you can. This is intuitive because it taps into the signals that are in our brain, and it allows the sensory feedback to show us what we And there's plenty, plenty of different options. Ian Burkhardt, he started, and now we're still on, you can't see him right now at Caltech, JJ. Um, we started driving cars, and properly driving cars, not just press a button, but like full control, steering wheel, accelerator, brakes, um, it's slalom, the figure of eight, the U-turns, three-point turns, better than, one, than the one that I first did when I started learning how to drive. Um, and so it's really something that uh, gives an awful lot of quality of life back to people. So how do you get there? I'm going to skip some of their statements now. Here we can sort of move forward from that. Um, what do you need for that? And you may again encounter that in some encounter that in some of your projects. Um, in the end, the patient, and it's very very important, no matter what you're doing. You always need to understand what is the application and what is needed to make that work. There was even a case in my first company with the automotive applications. Yes, we were doing you know, high temperature sensors. We started with stuff that was put into the McLaren Formula One race car engines and then ended up in transmissions and hydraulic systems and whatever. But at that time, these sensors were not being used yet. And so we had to learn and understand what is required in terms of the user, in this case, the person who inside the car, and then the car manufacturer and the suppliers and what they needed. 
and then based on that rationale communicate why, for example, this additional sensor would make sense. And we would have to understand enough about the application, you know, I learned stuff how dual clutch transmissions work, for example, which I never had on here. You know, electrical engineering, don't really have that somewhere in your roadmap of skills to learn. Um, but you have to. And, you know, just like as we went into clinical applications here, I realized very quickly that if we don't understand the workflow of the hospital and the treatment of the patient, you know, from initial intake, the surgery, the caretakers, the fact, you know, another aspect you'll see eventually is the reimbursement who pays for all of that. Well, there are actually different insurances and payers for the different stages from the accident to the initial treatment to the relapse to the long term care. Um, you need to understand these aspects, and so I would like to encourage you, even though you may have come in to develop a new material for something that is important in batteries or a new AI technique for, you know, new filters and communication or to speed up, uh, speed up search engines or whatever, um, try to find the area where you dig deep and you contribute your special knowledge where you're the world expert. But make sure that you understand the context. And if you understand what other paths to a solution there may be. You know, sometimes people look at the state of the art and it just looks like an inch to the left and the right. You know, everybody who's also used iridium oxide as a material for an electrode. But maybe it's the wrong material in the first place. Or there's very different ways. Or maybe I don't even need an electrode because there are other ways. So then it's very important to understand that. So application of all the aspects. The next thing is, um, now let's assume we've got that figured out. Now we need an electrode. In this case, it's a device that has to interface with biological tissue. Not an easy environment to be in. The body really dislikes it when you put stuff there that doesn't belong. So now we need to figure out, and then it fights back. And that means <coughs> the devices you put inside the body tend to fail and be encapsulated. Uh, and sometimes there's collateral damage, i.e. because of the process of fighting back, um, other tissue is, is being damaged. So you need to understand it. So now you need to develop electrodes that invoke as little of a tissue response as possible. That means understanding the biology. Now, you may not have to be the expert in all of that, but you want to talk to somebody who understands neurophysiology, who understands cell cultures, etc., and work with them to figure that out. There's a materials degradation problem. It's a material science challenge. Essentially, what you do is you put devices that are made out of silicon, and metal, and certain polymers, whatever, into environments that are wet, have ions around them, some amounts of current flowing. If they're active, you may have put a battery in there. So to some extent, you're building all sorts of little electrical chemicals, uh, electrochemical cells that want to deteriorate. So you need to figure out how can I prevent that from happening and stabilizing it. So finding encapsulations, finding metallizations and, and, and metallurgy that uh, limits the amount of electrochemical potentials between the different materials, etc., to reduce the deterioration aspect. Now let's say you figured out your chip, the little electrode that you've seen briefly in the video that was held up. Well, that's useless if you can't talk to it, right? So now you need to wire this thing up. You need to get the data out. So now you've got an assembly process, which is partially the electrical materials and the mechanical engineering process, again, uh, has to be figured out. Assume you've got that one done, now it's the electronics. We're going in here, these, uh, these uh, neural signals, actually potentials tend to be of the order of no tens to maybe 100 microvolts or so, action potentials, in a millivolt noise environment. And the problem is electricity, but an amplifier with filters, you crank up the power. Not that easy, because if you now have that as an implantable device, not only do you need low power so that you don't have to drag a car battery around in order to make it work, you also don't want to heat the tissue. There are very, very tight constraints to the amount of electrical power you can dissipate in terms of heat inside the tissue. So, oh, now what you can do is you want to have someone who can help you with, um, for example, thermal simulations in, in 
environments that have sort of a continuum, but maybe also vascularity, also now there's convection. You see how all these things fit together. Um, I'll sort of fast forward a little bit. Let's assume we've got all that sorted out. Now you've got tons of data. Do you care? Actually, what you care about is information, right? So how do we get turned now? You know, you've got 100, in some cases now 1,000. We have a project where we're doing 10,000 and 50,000 channels of electrodes sampling at 10 to 30 kilo samples a second, 12 bits. The amount of data that is generated is mind-boggling. Not easy to deal with. So now you need to figure out how to extract information from that. 95% of it is hash. You know, you just keep recording nothing's happening or something that is not relevant. So now you need to have, and that is very high machine learning, for example, if you're interested in that is coming in, you want to detect features. These action potentials have a specific form. If you can find that and replicate that, then maybe you could create an architecture, a little bit like the Internet of Things, or how our own nervous system works, is um, well on the front end, you have a smart component that keeps constantly, like an endless video tape recording at very high resolution, but it keeps searching also for, well, where is the information? Is there action potential? How is it time? Maybe not just swipe thresholding, but something that gives you information about how that waveform looks like. And then it only broadcasts, instead of n to the power k data points, it just broadcasts, I got information at this time point, and here are the three or four parameters that define, within a reasonable error, how this waveform looked like. Much less data than all of that that goes downstream. And maybe you then have on the external side, you know, a database or a network that occasionally listens on a channel and keeps listening continuously, and then you can have whatever reinforced learning approaches or others that help you improve those filters. So it's almost like a headquarter that occasionally listens in sends signals back to your front end and says, you may want to tweak your parameters for your filter a little bit or for uh, your statistical model uh, in order to make it better or respond to something. So, and that is just the beginning. And then you, once you've got that figured out, now what the hell are we going to do with this? Um, so, it's, it's a fascinating field that gives a lot of opportunities. And, uh, yeah, and some of them are more near term. You know, something that, for example, we figured out and that turned into a large project that we're involved in on the University of Utah, University of Minnesota, uh, Hanover Medical School in Germany, which is the largest city for cochlear implants, MedL, one of the three big players. Um, uh, my company is also involved. And um, realized that for people with severe hearing deficiencies, there's a technology that you may have heard of, which is called cochlear implants, where you take little electrode that you insert into the cochlea, which is the same shape in the ear portion of your ear, and you electrically stimulate air to invoke hearing. Pretty simple. You know, the, 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 the inner ear actually has a tonotopy where the frequencies are sort of following the little spiral of that inner ear, which makes it kind of easy depending on where you're located, you've got a different frequency. One of the challenges is that the electrodes sit in the inner ear in cochlear fluid, there's a bony wall behind it, and so actually what happens is that the current spreads out, something that again you can simulate through field simulation. Um, and so while you can increase the number of electrodes to get more frequencies, physiologically you don't get it because they all overlap. So somewhere between 8 and 10 you're sort of petering out. So a way to solve that, and at the same time, reaching a larger patient population, because sometimes people don't qualify because uh, they have an ossified cochlea or something degenerative of the nerve, whatever. Um, and there's actually a decent percentage of people that doesn't get good hearing out of it. So well, if we go a little bit further, the auditory nerve connects the cochlea to the brain. The tonotopy, so that, that sort of spiral uh, frequency distribution continues in the nerve. If you now have an electrode where you can go in, and very selectively record and stimulate from individual fascicles, individual nerve fibers, without crosstalk that you have when you go into the cochlea. Now you have an opportunity 
to possibly have a lot more frequencies. And uh, people have done research on that and have shown that somewhere between 50 to 100 frequencies, we get to something that is not so unsimilar to the kind of hearing that you and I are used to. You can probably find there's some online tools that you can find out where you can sort of simulate how somebody were to hear with a cochlear implant with four or six or eight channels. And one-on-one -on -one in a quiet room, that's actually working reasonably well. You can understand. It's a little bit like the electronic equivalent to a blind man's walking stick. But it really, really helps. Once all of you start chit-chatting, because you get bored, get bored uh, about what I'm saying here or whatever, he's not going to understand me anymore. If there's music, it sounds horrible in that sense. So that is something that we're trying to do. Here. Now, in order to get into that fairly quickly, however, sometimes the solution is not to develop everything from the ground up. The auditory processor, the actual IPG uh, implantable program, uh, pulse generator, is actually this module that sits inside the patient from a cochlear implant is still very, very valuable. We just need a different electrode and a few other items that we can go into detail later uh, that you need to address. And then you can just like in Lego boxes take those components of a different electrode assembly with components that you already have put them together. And you get much more quickly into a setting where you can then first in animal models and then in the objects test whether indeed that works better. Um, so, jump into this already a little bit, but I think an important message uh, that I sort of want to bring across is that in almost all applications, uh, there are multiple aspects. And I think it's important for you, even as you specialize in one area, to at least understand the language that people may be speaking in those areas, and to have enough knowledge to be a little bit dangerous and be able to define the interfaces. It'll make for a better thesis, a better understanding. It'll make you more competitive as you graduate, because you can put things into context. And very often, when you're, when you're asked to find a solution, you may be drawn on board because you're the expert for problem A or B. But there are often different ways of getting there. And just like in optimization problems, often a local minimum or maximum doesn't necessarily need to a global minimum or maximum or optimum. That's the same thing here. So I want to encourage you to, to look at these aspects. Get through this here. Um, applications I've talked about as well. Um, there's obviously when you launch a technology, uh, an important aspect is to, um, you want this to be driven by something that is, that is relevant and that reaches a lot of people, otherwise it becomes very hard to make it sustainable. That being said, very often when you initially start, it is great to have something that is like a beachhead, a problem case, a patient population that has no other options and where it's uniquely needed. You know, could be like when we started with our high temperature pressure sensors. Initially, it was Formula One race engines and uh, launch vehicles, you know, like Ariane spacecraft and others that didn't care an awful lot about cost, but they cared about performance and reliability. And it was really, a, I don't care how much this thing costs, if it costs a million dollars, I'll still want it because it has to do A and B. Same, same with at NASA, you know, friends at, at NASA, they always say, we're really good at making things work. We're not so good at cost control, <laughs> you know, because it's really a little bit of, you know, what can we as mankind accomplish? And the reality is that eventually, you need to design to cost in every single application. In this one, it's excruciating. People like, uh, used to be Iron Flesh, now Texas Instruments, every nine months, a new product. The price pressure, the cycles, is excruciating. It's a fascinating field, but you want to think about is that one area that you want to, to work in. Other areas are much, much slower. Uh, there's a little bit more buffer, but none of them is excluded from it. Then you want to have a path for how you can use some of that and apply it in more and more area. Broaden the use cases, broaden the applications, increasing the volume. There's an additional advantage if you work in a niche application initially, it allows you to learn. Because things don't always work from the get-go, you know, and, and it's true even, I mean, usually when a new software comes out, there's always glitches, 
Now, yourself, you're sort of probably used to the reset button and try again, whatever. You do not want to do that with a pacemaker or a brain implant or an airplane if they fly either. That is why there's regulatory requirements that are very, very intense. And so, as you go out there, it's also helpful to start in small and more confined applications and then, and then grow that as you gain confidence and if you know how to deal with, with challenges and, and problems. I need to talk a little bit about that. The only reason I have this one in here for brain computer interfaces is that uh, I think something to consider as you're looking at your future career and dreams is to try and find areas that are growing rapidly and that have uh, a lot of sort of firepower behind it. Why? Because it will create more opportunities for you. And it creates an environment that is a lot more failure tolerant. We all make mistakes, I constantly make I come up with a thousand new ways of making new mistakes almost every <laughs> year. Infuriating. You know, when you just figure, you figure it all out, then you come up with a new way of screwing things up. Um, if you're in a domain that is consolidated, markets are going down, it's very competitive, you're out. If you're in a field where you desperately need it, and uh, lucky for you, electrical engineers overall are really, really desperate to need it right now. Everybody's going into computing and other areas, but the reality is 80% of the systems out there are EEs. If I talk to the employers out there, they're begging us to double our production rate of, of uh, engineers at all levels. Because you need people with the kind of background that you're, that you're getting. And that means that you're going out there and, and you're able to learn a little bit and occasionally. If you're in a domain that is consolidated, markets are going down, it's very competitive, you're out. If you're in a field where you're desperately needed, and uh, lucky for you, electrical engineers overall are really, really desperately needed right now. Everybody's going into computing and other areas, but the reality is 80% of the systems out there are easy, right? talk to the employers out there, they're begging us to double our production rate of, of engineers at all levels. Because you need people with the kind of background that you're, that you're getting. And that means that you're going out there and, and you're able to learn a little bit and occasionally screw up and not immediately be on the like this. Um, yeah, I wanted to say, show you a few pictures of how this can grow. I mean, I'm somebody who sort of started here on the materials, very, very small devices side. And it is still, I would say, the strength of my primary contribution beyond the overall vision. But I had to learn all these other areas, or at least understand enough about them, because in the end, what you're interested in, what he or she can do in the real world, and so you need to yeah, figure out how to interface with people in those areas and also make sure that you create your own network and teams of people that can, can support that. Now, one thing that is also important is, you know, as engineers, um, we're usually really good with fiddling with things, often not so great with people. Um, Many of us, uh, I wasn't able to speak the way I can speak right now, as you've seen me sort of 25, 30 years ago. So I had to learn that the hard way. Most of us are better with computers and labs, otherwise socially awkward. Um, and um, and uh, you sort of have to, have to learn that. Beyond the technical side, however, there are two areas that I really want to make you aware of. That, that are going to be really important. We're no longer working in a vacuum. We're not the engineers out of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that, for example, helped build things that advanced nuclear technologies, but that also led to the to nuclear weapons. Uh, you need to be aware of the ethics associated with those nuclear technologies and uh, of the regulations. A lot of products, even human products, are partially regulated. But, you know, cars, airplanes, medical devices are heavily regulated. So you need to understand those standards and norms and the paths, the requirements for documentation, 
And uh, in some cases, you may even want to try to get some exposure here, you know, to Utah office courses in regulatory training, for example. Uh, and that is very, very valuable also in terms of your research process and all of documentation and different things to do before you embark on them, which is a little bit different from the way that we often do this and sort of fiddle with it and play with it and figure it out and start to document that. And some of that is there, you know, the early more towards the fundamental science side, there is an element of exploration there. But it's still important to consider that. On the ethics side is, um, you know, something that, for example, in the context of the framework between interfaces, um, really important to start a discussion early uh, and be open-minded in all directions. You know, when technologies are in their infancy, it's very, very hard to predict outcomes. The problem is, when you're late in the game, it's very hard to make changes. So the point in case, the social media, you know, all that Facebook and other stuff, seemed like a wonderful idea. Everybody jumped on it, it exploded. And 15 years later, there's all sorts of things you realize, well, maybe we should have thought, thought that through a little bit, or set up some guardrails that uh, prevent some of the side effects, or, you know, people being in echo chambers longer confronted with novel ideas, uh, everything being driven by algorithms that drive only information to you that seems to be of interest to you, um, which, which really um, can create uh, quite, quite problematic situations. And so whenever you embark on a new technology, and it does impact people, I think it's important to figure out what are the fundamental underlying principles the society we want to apply as we establish these technologies. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to agree. Just like with these brain computer interfaces, you know, for me, this is driven absolutely by the need of patients. You're only making others believe in a future where everybody's going to have a brain implant, something that speaks to quite a lot. You know. yes, I see um, uh -huh. But, no. If you look at society, there will likely be people who will embrace it. There will be people who will uh, torches and pitchforks who will go after it and be devil it. And then the rest of us will be in the middle trying to figure out how to not end up on the wheel. Um, and that's why I think it is so important to to think these things through. You know, just like in genetics, for example, you know, now you can flow ourselves quite reliably. The question came up uh, several times, so if it would help, could you clone human cells? And uh, just because it's technically impossible doesn't mean that you necessarily should do that. The important thing is either to start a conversation. Um, at the same time, you want to stay open-minded, you know, just like the nanotechnology in around the people who sort of the other extreme. The first thing that the European Commission did is put out all sorts of standards to sort of keep nanotechnology from being used because they were worried about negative side effects. The same thing here, uh, people are discussing regulating PCIs before it's actually the material of the market. So when we talk about what markets are important, um, um, this is again an example of something that said understand your customer. And so for example, a lot of able-bodied people would say with the of they want to walk. Actually, you know, I mean, of course, if they, they could dream, they would. But if you really talk to them, they're saying, well, control over my body functions is important. Communication is important. Um, having independence, this weird shaping I can sort out. And so, um, you know, that is something that you want to, uh, you know, sort of consider all of that. And needs to drive what is it that you're actually bringing out of the market. It also sometimes surprises, you know, for example, with some of our devices, I thought there were a lot more technical hurdles we had to jump through before this goes out there. And then in 2018, now, four years ago, uh, we had a meeting where we put uh, patients on stage for the first time, not the surgeons, the grad students, the professors or whatever, said, so, you know, I only hear from the people that are actually having these problems. And they came back and said, you know, this works. I want to take it home. Can I? And everybody said, oh, no, 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 no. 
this isn't really safe yet, and we haven't done this yet, we haven't done that yet. I said, yeah, but I don't care. Don't you need 10 or 20 years lifetime? I cannot be with two. Um, you know, and so it's really, really important to not make assumptions, but to get those people involved that are on, on the, that the benefits of that. So the question is, are we reaching an inflection point? There's another important story. You know, sometimes there's a hype and uh, public perception is often different from what is happening in the real world. But when I look at it in, in terms of the technology we just talked about, is there's a few signs that you can look for. One of them is certain technological advancements. Over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen an increasing occurrence and frequency, bless you, of world first demonstrations in human subjects. You know, not just, you know, occasionally something happens, but it's more and more often and more and more breakthroughs and more and more records being broken. Um, there have been significant advances in visualization, AI machine learning, things that 15 years ago didn't exist, weren't possible, now are on a very small substrate. That changes things. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities that come out because, you know, fabrication technology and things like that. Capital entered the market very, very often. The Human Genome Project was something that was originally funded by the US government. I think three, five billion dollars or so that went into that. But if we only took off after eventually the industry realized that we can do new drugs, we can do new diagnostics, new treatments, etc. All the stuff that we've seen how quickly they responded to COVID, some of the tests and whatever goes back to 30 years prior to having been a human genome project to decode the human genome. It wasn't until the financial markets jumped in and multiplied what the US government had put in by a factor of 10 to 100 in funding that things started taking off. So something that despite the sometimes uh, maybe also challenging statement that somebody like, like uh, um, somebody like Elon Musk has been making is really to be credited with is he put it on the map. He showed people, you know, honestly, there's an opportunity there. Financial markets realize it. Now there's a dozen, a few dozen companies that are entering into that market. You want to make sure that you have sustainability. You need to understand the markets in this case. You need to understand um, how you can get to something that can keep going when you invest in business and pumping money into it. So that has to be uh, the forefront, which it also ties into, again, remember what I said, design to cost. If new time like ours is costing as much as a cardiac pacemaker or costing the marketing ideas for the that's a lot of money. But then we're thinking to spend up to six million dollars in their lifetime just to be taken care of. But it's a no brainer is actually you know a, a, a wheelchair compatible van is like seventy to hundred thousand dollars. So plans that over 10 years or whatever, and it seems really important, you have to get places. $25,000 If the implant was $200,000 or $500,000, very different story. Now it becomes an opinion. Only very wealthy people can have it. Well, I mean, it doesn't scale. Now, if something sells for $25,000, how much do you think it can cost to make? Yeah. So about five here, two and a half to five. The rest doesn't lead to necessarily massive profits for shareholders. It's what pays for regulatory engineering people like you, you know, the PhD level people that help develop it. They are very, very expensive eventually. So you can actually increase, uh, assume pretty significant salary increases unless you become a professor. Uh, <laughs> the academic and general publication count increasing. Uh, some of the ethics and public discussions are starting. And so that's why I said we appear to now be at a cusp of this really, really taking off. And so the final thing I wanted to uh, just highlight one thing that we're, that we're doing right now is it started as the yeah, idea was the Sweet Project. Uh, one of our, we work on one of our, our patients really loves driving cars, obviously a significant limited there in this car of state. And so the idea came up, why the hell not break the car in the bottom of a salt glass during the speed group? Go for it. That idea started about five years ago in September 2000, August, September 2017. And I spent 
about the year running from punches to time A to time somebody involved to do that for us because of the end of those, well, that won't work. And it's way too dangerous. And we don't want to do that. And the organization can go sideways. And long story short, we're actually doing it right now. There'll be information coming out. But the idea is to get somebody to work on that, work in a simulation environment. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is that the people we're working with right now.